Let's go live button. So let's wait for the stream to fire up all across the beautiful fruited plains of the internet. And then we can go ahead and get started. Always like to make sure that it is alive and well on all of the different platforms. If you're not familiar where we broadcast, it's kind of all over the place. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitch, we're even on Rumble, but YouTube is always a little bit slow, but it looks like we're live. So let's get started. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live. My name is Robert Gruler. I am a criminal defense attorney here at the r, &R Law Group in the always beautiful and sunny Scottsdale, Arizona, where my team and I, over the course of many years, have represented thousands of good people facing criminal charges. And throughout our time in practice, we have seen a lot of problems with our justice system. I'm talking about misconduct involving the police. We have prosecutors behaving poorly. We have judges not particularly interested in a little thing called justice and it all starts with the politicians the people at the top the ones who write the rules and pass the laws that they expect you and me to follow but sometimes have a little bit of difficulty doing so themselves that's why we started this show called watching the watchers so that together with your help we can shine that big beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice. And we're grateful that you are here and with us today because we've got a lot to get into. We're going to pick up on the Tucker Carlson NSA story. Never been a big fan of the government coming in and sort of spying all over your private data and information. And when Tucker Carlson came out some time ago, and said that they suspected that the NSA was doing this. He kind of got pilloried out there in the media and from some of his media colleagues. But now there's a new story out from Axios, from Jonathan Swan, that gives us a little bit more detail about what was happening here. In particular, there's some idea that Tucker Carlson was trying to get an interview with Putin, and that is what triggered the NSA to gobble, uh, gobble up some of those conversations and then unmask the other end of the phone call, which of course happens to be Tucker Carlson. So we're going to show you what's going on with there, it, you know, with that story. A lot of unanswered questions, a lot of you know, sort of speculation still floating around out there, but we're going to see if we can make some sense of it. Then we're going to talk about big, pretty big news of the day. Saw this all over the place, but Michael Avenatti, the former savior of the Democratic Party, the man who is going to bring down Donald Trump himself, is now going to prison for two and a half years. And so we've got a, a, a brief overview of what happened today during the sentencing proceeding. Of course, this happened in federal court, and so we're not going to see video or anything like that, but we've got some uh, a, a, a transcript of what one of the reporters who was listening in heard at that time. And so we're going to go through and tell you what happened at Avenatti's sentencing because he was apparently pretty upset. And we're also going to take a look at his next case because he's not done yet. He's going to prison for two and a half years in New York, but they're going to fly him over to California because he's scheduled for a trial. I think it's starting next week. And we've got a copy of the prosecution, the government's trial memorandum. And so we can sort of see what they're going to be alleging in that next case. And so we're going to talk about that. We've got some of those documents as well. And then lastly, we're going to talk about Hunter Biden. Kind of been a while since we've uh, talked about that guy. But he's back in the news because the White House is now expressing a little bit of concern about these art deals that he's got coming down the pike. He is a part of this sort of prestigious gallery in New York. And the White House has some concerns now that, that maybe there might be some ethical concerns here or some conflicts of interest if Hunter Biden, who, to my knowledge, really hasn't been, you know, uh, somebody an, who was an artist at, at, per training, somebody who was the president's son for a long period of time, was flying all over the world, a lot of, a lot of you know, uh, extracurricular activities that are a part of his background, but you know, artistry was never really one of them. And so now the allegation is that that there are people that want to buy his artwork for something like half a million dollars, $500,000 or $75,000, which many people who know a little bit more about the Bidens, who know sort of how these deals have been working with Hunter Biden being on Burisma and some of these other foreign uh, country boards just being funneled tens of thousands of dollars every month just to kind of be in close proximity to Joe Biden, who was the vice president at the time. So now people are saying, well, maybe this is money laundering. Maybe this is some sort of a, a, a scheme where they can just funnel money over to Hunter Biden. They'll call it artwork and then they will uh, just go about their business as usual. So we're going to talk about that and a lot more. We've got a lot to get into. If you want to be a part of the show, then we are uh, I'm going to invite you to head on over to watching the I'm looking at the chat. 
right now. It's why I pause there a little bit. But there's a lot of awesome people over here. We've got ZZ, the boxing cat. He's got a friend across the pond wanting to know if they could sing onto the Trump, big, uh, sign onto the Trump big tech class action. Uh, you know about that? I, I don't know, right? I don't practice class action law. But we've got Joe Snow's here. Sharon Quidney's here. TOS Forever is over here. We've got uh, Miss Lucky 21, Thunder 7, three girlies are in the house over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And we're going to check in with the chat as we go throughout the show. Hello, Freedom Lies. Hello, Jeremy Matrita and some of the others. So head on over there, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And be sure to check out some of the other links down in the description below, as well as subscribe and give us a thumbs up if you're on YouTube or anywhere else. We do very much appreciate that. Okay, so let's get into the news of the day. Tucker Carlson has been making the allegation that the NSA spied on him, that they actually went into his emails and they got some information about a story that he was working on. And he made a pretty big claim a couple weeks ago saying that they may be doing this to try to take him off of the air. And as soon as he aired this piece, all of his colleagues in the media were sort of going, oh, that Tucker, he's just being ridiculous again. That's just a crazy right winger out there. And all he is doing is just making up a bunch of stuff that's not even remotely related to reality. Well, if you have been a part of this channel, you know that what Tucker is saying here actually resembles the truth. We've talked about the government doing this previously historically when the government was sort of wiretapping or gobbling up conversations that Michael Flynn was having with the Russian ambassador Vissilyak some time ago. And so we, we've understood this framework for some period of time. Can okay, let me frame this out just briefly here. It, it, ordinarily, if the U.S. government is going to get, it, capture some conversations or interfere with your data, poke in your email address, you know, listen in on your phone calls, or any of that other stuff, the general rule is they need a warrant. And so it, Tucker Carlson is a U.S. citizen, and so all of those protections apply to him. Now, the, the tricky part comes in when we're talking about conversations with foreign people, foreign intermediaries, foreign adversaries, foreign citizens, any of those things, because our U.S. Constitution doesn't apply to them, right? Their Constitution applies to them. So our intelligence communities, they will gobble up all those conversations. A U.S. citizen having a conversation with a foreigner, they'll say, well, gobble all of those up and just listen in because that sort of gives us license to do that because it's outside of the jurisdiction of the United States. Then what ends up happening is because they want to make sure they're protecting U.S. citizens, they will do what's called masking, right? So they'll mask one side of the phone call and just listen in on the other side of the phone call. That's how they sort of get around the rules. Oh, well, we're not, we're not actually spying on any Americans at all. And we're just going to just mask the Americans. And that way we can get around the Fourth Amendment. So they've been doing that for some time. What happened in Michael Flynn's case, of course, is that the unmasking procedure, so Michael Flynn had been previously masked, but the unmasking procedure is sort of like a joke. You just kind of, I guess, you know, press a button, send an email, you know, fill out a form, something like that happens, but they just go, yeah, unmask, unmask, unmask. You, you get an unmask, you get an unmask. Everybody's unmasked, oh, it's Oprah. And everybody goes hog wild. And that's exactly what was happening during the Obama administration. So they create these protections like, oh, we're gonna mask people up and make sure they're identities are protected. And then practically on the back end, there's really no checks or balances whatsoever at all. And that's how Michael Flynn was sort of unmasked and then spread around. And that turned into a whole can of worms that we're still sort of not really sure what happened there. And it is, you know, it's highly politicized and it what looked like to be an entirely political prosecution, which of course is highly, highly problematic. So we know that there's precedence for this. We know that in Tucker Carlson's case, Something like this could easily have happened. And I want to show you what he said previously. Okay, so this is a couple weeks ago. This is his, his original allegation. He says that they absolutely are spying on him specifically. But it's not just political protesters the government is spying on. Yesterday, we heard from a whistleblower within the U.S. government who reached out to warn us that the NSA, the National Security Agency, is monitoring our electronic communications and is planning to leak them in an attempt to take this show off the air. Now, that's a shocking claim, and ordinarily we'd be skeptical of it. It's illegal for the NSA to spy on American citizens. It's a crime. It's not a third world country. Things like that should not happen in America. But unfortunately, they do happen, and in this case, they did happen. The whistleblower, who is in a position to know, repeated back to us information about a story that we are working on that could have only come directly from my texts and emails. There's no other possible source for that information, period. So it, it may very well be that that 
so, you know, having a conversation with somebody who's a foreign intermediary, NSA gobbles that up, and somehow Tucker's unmasked, right? Somebody in the NSA gets a notice, hey, man, we're looking at your emails right here. We're looking at this story you're working on. Want to let you know about this. And so the question then becomes, well, why, you know, how was that unmasking? How did that happen if that was, in fact, how this was unveiled? And, you know, look, I know that Tucker himself has gotten a lot. He's kind of been pilloried in the media about this. Keith Olbermann, we've got a, a screenshot from him out there. And a lot of people on the left were making fun of him. And a lot of people on the right were as well. And I just want to, you know, I think spying, spying in general is a giant problem that we have here in the United States, right? I've said that a lot. I, I, I have called people like Edward Snowden and Julian Assange heroes and people who are, you know, foisting the flag of transparency and accountability and sort of pulling the rug out from the government in certain areas where they should not be doing what they're doing, right? He's exposed, they're exposing this for what it is. And I don't, I don't approve of it in any way, shape or form. I think it's a huge, huge infringement on our own civil liberties, but it's sort of been something that we've all just sort of gotten used to, right? They just do this. And we know that they, they, they have been doing it. We know that they've done it entirely confidentially. We've talked about this with the PRISM case. We've talked about the Five Eyes alliance that is taking place between all of, you know, five different liberal democracies around the world. And the list goes on. There's 18 intelligence communities plus Space Force, and the list goes on. They are listening and watching everything. So many Americans have just said, well, that's okay. We don't care. Oh, we're going to put that device over there that listens to me and that one and this one too, and then walk around with our cell phones all day. But it's just life now. You really can't escape it. So that's just how it is. The problem has always become when and sort of the government is doing it against certain ideologies or against certain people using it as a, a very specific tool, not as a shield to protect America, but almost as a sword to go after your political enemies. And in Tucker's case, right, he's a member of the media and the media we've all called the fourth estate, right? There's sort of this organization that is supposed to hold the government accountable. We've got the government and then we've got the, these these watchdogs and these journalists that are supposed to be in there saying, hey, we want to know what you're doing in there, sir, madam, whatever, congressperson. We want answers on this. And largely, our ineffective sort of emasculated media has very little uh, fortitude. And so very little hard questions have been asked recently, uh, uh, unfortunately. So that's a problem when the government now is going after the media in, in particular. And remember when this was happening, when Donald Trump said, well, we're going to close the White House press briefing room, there was a meltdown in the media. Everybody was freaking out. Oh, they, we've never seen this type of assault on journalism and journalists. And, you know, th this is dangerous and journalists are going to be getting, you know, uh, hurt and killed around the country because of this language. And they all just hyperventilated astronomically, right? I mean, the, the CO2 levels in the room went up about 10, 10 points. And then now it's all been kind of like a kind of silent, right? We're hearing allegations from a journalist who says the NSA was spying on my stuff. And we've got some pretty concrete evidence about that because they're repeating stories back to us that they would never have access to. And then everybody just sort of laughed at that. Going after the media is... Is, is sort of now, I think, just a common part of our, our politics, right? Trump did this, and I, right, the media is, is, I think, highly problematic. But if, if you're inside the media, right, if you're a journalist, I've got a problem with the media in general, but if you're a journalist, if you're somebody who's working for the New York Times, and you say that what Trump was doing to the New York Times was problematic, but you're not standing up here and saying, well, what the Biden administration through the NSA is doing to Tucker, well, then you've got a little bit of an inconsistency there. So you might want to address that. But, you know, largely, I think that the government spying on anybody, whether it's Tucker or MSNBC or anybody is a giant problem. And the line needs to be drawn in the sand there. When the government is investigating somebody who is also in the media, but is also on the opposition, like Tucker is, directly opposed to Joe Biden and his administration, that is highly problematic, right? Now you're talking about specifically breaching civil liberties in order to go after your political opponents. And Tucker happens to be one of the most powerful in the country, of course, because of the size of his audience and because of his show. It's a great show. He does, he does actually, you know, I think very good investigative journalism, whereas many other journalists do not. So they're not going to rally to his side, of course, but we now know that maybe there's some more to the story. Previously, they were saying this whole thing's a joke. Tucker's a joke. He's always been a joke. And now maybe there's a little bit more uh, credibility here because we're going to go from the NSA coming out here and saying, oh, no, he wasn't the target of anything to now maybe, uh, well, well, maybe we actually did get some of those communications. So we have this article from Jonathan Swan. He did a great piece over at Axios. And I want to show you a little bit more about him. So this is him. He is over on Twitter, almost a million followers. So he's got a big presence. And uh, you can find him here at Jonathan V. Swan. So we'll check him out. 
He wrote this article over at Axios. He says, Scoop, Tucker Carlson sought Putin interview at the time of the spying claim, right? So, so, so it, it, watch the story kind of shift. Right? I'm, not, I'm not trying to be critical of Jonathan Swan here. It's a good article. But you can kind of watch the narrative, you know, shift from the NSA wasn't looking at anything that Tucker was doing to, well, yeah, well, I mean, they were, but he was talking to Putin. So, like, they had no choice because he was talking to America's enemy number one, as they've been telling us for a long time. So you can just watch that kind of shift happening right in front of your eyes. He says Tucker Carlson was talking to the U.S.-based Kremlin intermediaries about setting up an interview with Putin shortly before the Fox host accused the NSA of spying on him, says sources familiar with with the conversations. He says why it matters. Those sources said that U.S. officials learned about Carlson's efforts to secure the Putin interview. Carlson learned that the government was aware of his outreach, and that's the basis of his extraordinary accusation, followed by a rare public denial by the NSA that he had been targeted. Axios has not confirmed whether any communications from Carlson have been intercepted. And if so, why? Right. So we're still sort of lacking some proof here. This article is going to go through and we're going to speculate and sort of dissect some of the different possibilities that are happening here. But I want to just be clear here. We're going to we're going to go through the article and we're going to sort of check in because Jonathan Swan, after this article, it is credit. I mean, he's, he's all over Twitter sort of trying to defend some of the misinterpretation of what he has written here. So you're going to see here that he's he's sort of explaining what's happening and gaming out some possibilities but also recognizing that there's a lot of information that we don't know here. And so people who are hopping on Twitter and saying, see, we told you so, Tucker was right, or Keith Olbermann saying, see, I told you so, he was talking to America's enemies, he, Swan's out there on Twitter sort of batting those down. Nope, that's not accurate, that's not accurate, that's not accurate, and I'm going to show you that here in a minute. So just want to frame that out. Let's see what else is in his article. He says, let's take a look at the big picture. We talked about this previously. He said, Carlson, when he made those charges, he instantly became a cause celeb on the right, which feasted on the allegation that one of America's most prominent conservatives might have been monitored by the U.S. intelligence community. Right. We talked about it here. Right. I was uh, sort of roiled up about it. The backstory. So Carlson told his roughly three million viewers on June 28th, that clip that I already just played for you, said that we heard from a whistleblower. They're monitoring our communications and they're planning to leak them in an attempt to take us off the air. So we played that. Carlson said his source was in a position to know and information came from his text and his emails. Said it's illegal for the NSA to spy on citizens, but we know they do happen, as we had talked about in the Michael Flynn case and others. The NSA said in a tweet the next night that his allegation is untrue. Here's what they wrote in their statement. We talked about this as well. They said that Tucker Carlson alleged that they have been, quote, monitoring our electronic communications. They say this allegation is untrue, but they refer to one allegation singular and they're making and he's making two right here right monitoring and then the attempt to take off his show there's an and right here so it's it's facially non-responsive it's only responding to one combined allegation rather than addressing either of those but i guess you can bunch them up together and say neither are true tucker carlson has never been an intelligence target of the agency which is great which as as we've mentioned here he's not saying that he was the target he's saying we want to know were you monitoring the communications that's a whole separate question that this paragraph does not answer. NSA has a foreign intelligence mission. Okay, again, non-responsive, doesn't matter. We target foreign powers. Okay, so like Putin. And the NSA may target a citizen with limited exceptions without a court order, but they have to have the certain exceptions if it's explicitly authorizing the targeting. So it's like, thank you for that information, NSA. That's very nice. Thank you for sending us the policy manual, I guess, that you have over there, but... How about the actual question? Are you monitoring? Did you intercept any of those conversations? Might be good to know. So that was a while back. Fox News then today gave this response to Axios. They said, we support any of our hosts pursuing interviews and stories free of government interference. So good for them. Tucker Carlson said, as I've said repeatedly, because it's true, the NSA read my emails and then leaked their contents. That's an outrage as well as illegal. So it's unclear why Carlson or his source would think this outreach could be the basis of NSA surveillance or a motive to have his show canceled. So now you can see that, that this journalist is actually being responsive to the claim of Tucker Carlson. And Tucker Carlson, is he's sort of breaking these up into two claims. Number one, of course, being that they're monitoring him. Number two being that there is a motivation to take him off of the air. And so let's just keep those two separately. We can have a pin in each one of those. One, I think, is absolutely pretty clear. The other, I think, is a little bit more speculative. And I think that even Tucker Carlson might be saying that 
maybe they're, maybe his allegation that they were trying to take him off the air is going to be more difficult to prove. And so maybe that was just sort of a, a little bit of an exaggeration. We'll see. It says it's unclear why he made those claims. He says journalists routinely reach out to world leaders, right? Including leaders of countries that are not allied with the U.S. to request interviews. So the, the point here is if Tucker is doing that, then why would that get him off the air? He says it's not unusual to reach out through unofficial intermediaries rather than through the official press offices. So if Tucker is just doing regular journalism things, then why would his attempt to reach out to Putin mean that he would be off the air, right? Kind of, no, that's just journalism. The NSA doesn't care about that. Now he says numerous American journalists have also interviewed Putin and Chris Wallace also just did so recently in 2018. So it's not even out of the ordinary. So the, 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 the point being, why would the NSA care? On Wednesday, yesterday, Carlson told Maria Bartiromo on Fox News, Fox Business, that his only his executive producer knew about the communications in question and that he didn't mention it to anybody else, including his wife. But of course, the recipients of the texts and emails also knew about their content. And we don't know how widely they shared this information, right? So it kind of goes both ways. So did somebody else leak that? And you're trying to connect the chain a little bit, right? If Tucker sends this to somebody else, to his uh, producer, and they're communicating back and forth, and then it goes to an NSA informant or somebody on the inside of the government who then is the whistleblower that communicates that back to Carlson. Well, the, the, the question is, how did the NSA person get that in the first place? How did it go from those emails to that person? Unless what Swan is saying here, the recipient of the text or the email themselves communicated that back to the NSA, which kind of seems like that might be far out there. All right, enough. Let's go back to the article. He goes, let's read between the lines. The NSA's public statement didn't directly deny that any Carlson communications had been swept up by the agency, right? Not at all. They didn't say that. They just said he wasn't the target. Axios then submitted a request for a comment to the NSA on Wednesday, asking whether they would be willing to categorically deny that the NSA intercepted any of Carlson's communications in the context of monitoring somebody he was talking to in an effort to set up an interview with Putin. An NSA spokesperson declined to comment and referred Axios back to the agency's earlier carefully worded statement that we just read that didn't say anything. In other words, the NSA is denying the targeting of Carlson, but is not denying that his communications were incidentally collected, right? Incidentally. Yeah, incidentally. It's just Tucker Carlson's, right? It happens to be Tucker Carlson, uh, probably the biggest right-wing commentator on the cable news today. Incidentally collected. Got it. All right. So what's next? Experts say there are several plausible scenarios, including legal scenarios, that could be applied, uh, that could apply. So let's run through a couple of these. The first and the least likely is that the U.S. government submitted a request to the, FORS, uh, the FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, to monitor Carlson to protect national security. Likelihood of that, probably low. A more plausible scenario is that one of the people Carlson was talking to as an intermediary was under surveillance as a foreign agent, right? So Tucker is talking to a foreigner that doesn't have the same protections against illegal spying that American citizens do. And so he got just kind of caught up in that and then somehow was unmasked and it leaked back over to him. In that scenario, Carlson's emails or text messages could have been incidentally collected as part of monitoring, but his identity would have been masked in any intelligence reports. Okay, so once it gets drafted, it's all mad. We don't know who that person is. In order to know that the text and emails were Carlson's, a U.S. government official would likely have to request his identity be unmasked, something that's only permitted if it's necessary to understand the intelligence. So they could be, you know, reading the transcripts and they could be listening or, or sort of, you know, reading the conversation. And if they can gather what is happening and they get actionable data from that, then that's it. That's the end of it. But if they need to know what person A is and what and who that is in order to get context about the conversation, then you, you have a good basis to, to unmask that person because it's necessary in order to understand the intelligence. So what happens if Tucker Carlson, uh, you know, who, who's unknown right now, he's an, an, an anonymous masked person, is having a conversation saying, hey, we want to bring Putin to New York. We want to have him sit down and tell us what he thinks about the Biden administration. And you have a, a, a NSA, you know, spook out there who's saying, oh my goodness, we have a, four, we have a U.S. citizen who's inviting 
Russia over to our country to sit down here and talk badly about the Biden administration? Uh oh, that might be a threat to America's security because we know just how dangerous Russia is. They've been at the forefront of every single problem that the United States has been facing for the last hundred years, according to the Democrats. So now we know that this is like a category five hurricane. We got to brace for impact because uh, Tucker Carlson or, or person A at this moment is talking to somebody who might be connected to Putin. So we have to unmask this person. Oh, 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 it's Tucker Carlson. How about that? So, you know, everything is fine. It's all kosher hunky dory because you're following the rules and you're just doing the unmasking just to understand the intelligence. And so maybe they say, oh, oh, it's Tucker Carlson. Oh, it's just a Putin interview. That's all. They just want to talk about, yes, Fox News and we don't like them anyways. But the point is they go through that whole thing. They unmask him and they, they you know, they're, they're, they're essentially, if it's the same procedures, more or less, as was happening with Michael Flynn, it, there really wasn't even much of a process at all to unmask somebody. It's just like, hey, send an email and it just happens. So we'll see if there's anything more there. There's a third scenario that Swan lays out for us. He says that interceptions might not have involved Carlson's communications. The U.S. government routinely monitors the communications of people in Putin's or orbit who may have been discussing the details of Carlson's request for an interview, right? So it'd be like, if if Tucker, who is a U.S. citizen, sends it to a foreign intermediary and the foreign intermediary, that conversation from Tucker to the foreigner is not being captured. But the foreigner then, who's in Russia, presumably, communicates that, let's say, to the Russian embassy over to Russian, uh, you know, Russian uh, scheduling person to the receptionist over there at Putin's residence. And then they get the whole thing scheduled. But maybe the U.S. intelligence services, the NSA, are actually monitoring those conversations. And they say, oh, oh, they're passing around memos about getting Putin scheduled in Tucker's studio. And so we're just monitoring that. And then the NSA person says, oh, no, we were just we weren't listening to you. They were talking about you. That's how your name came up. It had nothing to do. We weren't looking at your stuff. It was just somebody else who was talking about you. And that's what flagged it for me. So let's go back. It says under this scenario, though, Carlson's identity would have been masked in reports as part of his protection as a citizen. And the unmasking would only be permitted if a U.S. government official requested that his identity be unmasked. And it's not clear why that would be necessary here. Two sources familiar with Carlson, right? Because in that case, they're talking about an interview, right? They're not talking about, you know, hacking a pipeline again. They're talking about an interview. So why would they need to unmask Tucker Carlson if it's not necessary to understand the intelligence? Because they're talking about an, an interview, which is obviously very common. Chris Wallace did one, and we've noted that other people have interviewed Putin before. So what's the big deal? Why would they unmask him in that third scenario? Hmm, maybe they wouldn't. The intrigue this article wraps up says two sources familiar with Carlson's communication said that two Kremlin intermediaries live in the United States, but the sources could not confirm whether both are American citizens or whether both both were on U.S. So soil at the time they talked to Carlson. So what if what if now they were both U.S. citizens? Huh? that kind of changes the equation a little bit right now. Obviously illegal. Let's let's see here. He says this is relevant. Because if one of them was a foreign national and on foreign soil, the U.S. government wouldn't necessarily have had to seek approval to monitor their communication. So if they were on, if they were on foreign soil, right, not on U.S. soil. Okay, so let's see what else Jonathan Swan has to say. So he mentioned previously, right, this is the author of the article. He's, leaked, he's sending this over there. He says, NSA spokesman declined to comment, referring them back to the original story that they incidentally collected the material. Now, Jonathan Swan was out all over Twitter. This was today. And he's kind of just bouncing around defending the article, which I think is certainly to his credit. He's saying uh, to Keith Olbermann, remember Keith Olbermann? Haven't seen him around in a long time, but I just followed him over on Twitter because he is just hysterical to watch. As we told you at the time, he says, Tucker Carlson was communicating with a foreign based individual intent on harming the U.S., right? So that's Keith's claim saying that, well, that's what you get there, old Tucky Tuck. So that is something that uh, is perfectly lawful because you were talking to Putin, and as, as Keith Olbermann has been screeching about for the last 25 years, Putin is wrong with is what's wrong with the entire world, and he's responsible for Trump, and he you know, ruined Hillary's life, and all of this stuff. Very, very dramatic about it. So when Donald, oh, I'm sorry, when Tucker Carlson is communicating with Putin, he's saying, "Well, that's what you get. NSA should be spying on you because Putin has been wrecking America for a long time." Jonathan Swan, though, he says, "What? What? what? Keith?" He says, uh, "That's not what the story says, there, buddy boy." He says, "I have tried to get foreign interviews with adversaries and use back channels when front door doesn't work." Right as a journalist. Keith is a journalist. Keith was a journalist or 
pretends to be a journalist, but he knows how this works. He says, I would not expect my name to be unmasked if comms involving me or about me were intercepted. We don't know yet how the U.S. government learned info, only that they did, right? So we don't know how. How did they get it? Which is the big question. And that's where some of the impropriety really might, might be. And Jonathan Swan is, no. Reaching out to an adversary for an interview, perfectly legal, perfectly lawful. No reason to unmask that, right? It's part of the fourth estate. It's just regular journalism. -ing. Keith Olbermann doesn't quite get that, doesn't get much. But anyways, Jonathan Swan was out there also kind of clearing things up here with Sean Davis as well. Sean Davis says the details aren't cloudy at all. The corrupt intelligence community spied on Tucker, collected his communications, unmasked him, and then leaked his comms to reporters who are now refusing to, quote, confirm what their own government sources admitted to them. Jonathan Swan says, pushing back on this, he says, listen, if I had specific info on Tucker's communication, I would publish it. If I had info on an Intel report or unmasking, I would publish it. I don't. I published everything I could confirm so far. This piece lays out different scenarios and raises questions that we are still chasing. Okay. So there's still a lot to get to there. I think that Sean Davis is probably right, right? If you had to speculate, probably right, that they did in fact spy on him. They did collect his communications. They did unmask him and they are now sort of using this to, to their advantage, right? And that's not in evidence yet though. We don't have that yet. Jonathan Swan is, you know, push holding the line a little bit back from everybody who wants to sort of make this into something that it's not quite yet, but it might feel like it in fact is. All right. So let's take a look at the questions over from watching the watchers .locals .com. Let's see what we've got going on here. We've got a couple questions now popping in here. Joe Snow says the government is never punished. Be brave is here in the house. Want to know says the government caught to sell a house and work somewhere else, such a hassle for them like the Catholic Church. We've got, let's see who else is here. Want to know says teachers are part of the government. All right. Kenny 1B, there's a question, says most likely is that the intermediary that Tucker is using is also trying to recruit intelligence assets within the U.S. government for Russia. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, yeah, wow, interesting. Joe Snow says, if the entire federal government, let's not read that one. Let's see what else. Thunder is here. Says, Thunder 7 is here. Says, Rob, don't understand why Tucker is surprised that the NSA is spying on him. Obama and his crew spied on the Trump campaign five years ago. Trump was ridiculed by the fake news on a daily basis and called them the enemy of the people. Tucker experiencing just a tiny amount compared to what Trump has endured. Slings and arrows, says Thunder 9. Yeah, that is a good point, right? Donald, look, Donald Trump was very adversarial with the press. And I think for good reason. I think that they were not, not fair to him, you know, but what, can you expect that really? Probably not. You know, I, I have a big problem with the media. I think that they are completely one-sided, at least some of the mainstream ones that I follow, right? I, 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 for this show, I do pop around to many of the mainstream sources just to sort of keep my bearing straight. But the New York Times and the Washington Post and the L.A. Times and some of the other ones that I follow, they're pretty consistently ideologically one sided. Right. It's 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 pretty obvious if you read enough of them. So I don't know that that that's going to, to necessarily change. Right. Every politician is going to complain about the media. They all do. I don't think that that is even really, you know, what, what I'm upset about at all. It's, I don't really even care about that. It's the media you're in politics deal with that. They're going to be one-sided. We already know that that's just the playing field. The next, I guess, question though, is when does that become sort of illegal, right? When does the government pushing back against the media cross that line? And if you're going to be spying on journalists, that is clearly crossing the line, in my humble opinion. All right, let's see what else we've got. We've got Jeremy Matrita here. He says, even though the government spying on U.S. citizens is the norm, but it doesn't make it any more legal. That's true, right? And we shouldn't accept that. Right? It's, it's, just, it's just not something that I think we should just roll over on, which is why we're doing the show, of course. Let's see. We've got Joe Snow says... The NSA, FBI, CIA, IRS, ATF, Congress, White House. What have any of these people done for anybody lately? It's a good question. I don't really know. We got Kareem165 says, did you hear today that there will be a vaccine passport starting in September for Quebec? No, I did not hear that. I've been to Quebec. Hmm. Maybe not going back there, though. Thunder 7. Okay, we got Thunder 7 already. Let's see. 
what else we have here. We've got DK Poor here says, Rob, do you think that Congress can sort of reverse this unacceptable and illegal spying of U.S. citizens? Uh, I, that's a good question. You know, I would say technically they could, right? They could unwind the jurisdiction of the FISA court. You know, they, they set a lot of these policies in place, but I don't think that they would ever do that. I mean, technically, yeah, they could. Is that practically anything that's ever going to happen? I really don't think so. And even if they did, you know, based on what we've seen with PRISM and the Five Eyes and all of that sort of really, really undercover stuff that I think is built in at the root level, the backbone of the internet, I'm not real sure that there's really much of anything that, that can be done to put that genie back in the bottle, unfortunately. So privacy is obviously a big issue. And, you know, privacy can be one of those things that people can forfeit and that might lead them to being charged with crimes, which is a big big reason why it's so important. And if you happen to know somebody who is facing criminal charges in the state of Arizona, we would love the opportunity to help. We have an amazing team of people here at our law firm, the r, &R Law Group. We're quite good at what we do. We're very aggressive in court. We have fun here on the show, but when it's court time, it's court time. And we need to go in there and help you achieve your goals and reach the outcome that you deserve. And so our office is ready and available to help. Our phone number is 480-787-0394. The website is rrlawaz.com. And our mission here is to provide safety, clarity, and hope to good people facing criminal charges. And we'd love the opportunity to help. If you don't need any criminal representation, very good thing. Might want some informational offerings, including the law enforcement interaction training, which of course is over here available at gumroad.com slash Robert Gruller. It's a two and a half hour course that uh, you can get through pretty quickly. There's also a cheat sheet in there. So if you don't want to sit through two and a half hours, you don't need to. You can listen to about the first hour and a half and you'll have a crash course on criminal law and you'll understand how to interface with the police. But there's also just, if you just want to skip all that, just go get it. There's a slide deck, six slides, explains the whole thing. You can read that in about 10 minutes. If you want to check that out, gumroad.com slash Robert Gruller. All right. We're going to change gears now. Michael Avenatti. We've talked about him for some time here on the channel. Well, if for a while here, he was America's savior. He was going to just protect us all from Donald Trump, who, of course, was the megalomaniacal maniac out there who was going to just wreck everything for everybody. And so Avenatti was sentenced today. Here's a picture of him walking into court. He arrives for a scheduled sentencing hearing over at the Manhattan Federal Court. He's still masked up. He's a California lawyer who publicly sparred with then President Donald Trump before the criminal fraud charges. Today, he was in court and he was sentenced. And so now he's going to be going to prison for two and a half years, which is actually quite a light sentence. And so we're going to go through this today. I want to explain what happened here. I'm a criminal defense attorney. Okay, I don't like it instinctually when somebody goes to prison. It is it is a horrendous thing that often happens, okay? Michael Avenatti is a special kind of, of bad person, no question about it. We're going to get into that. But I just want to, you know, re remind ourselves that when this when this happens, basically everybody breaks, okay? You 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 sort of I've watched this happen. I've watched grown men with big companies just sort of crumble. When you're in front of a judge and you're getting sentenced, it's a big deal, right? Everything changes. Your ego just sort of strips away from you and it's a it's a it's a it's it's a humbling almost sacred symbolic experience. Okay? You're taking somebody, and I mean sacred not in a good way, but you know in a, in a it's a it's a powerful thing that happens. Somebody who was once free is now going into custody. Okay? It's a big deal. And so we just want to pause and have a little bit of humanity for that. Now, you know, you can have a lot of disdain for Michael Avenatti. I don't find him to be somebody who is an esteemable, esteemable person. And we're going to talk about that. And I also have a little bit of a, an increased lack of empathy for him, largely because of the fact that he's an attorney, right? And people hold attorneys in a little bit higher regard. And attorneys have a little bit of an unfair advantage. We have some extra training, some schooling, some years in court. And so when you are engaging with non-lawyers as a lawyer, it's kind of like, especially when you're talking about legal issues, it's kind of like, you know, uh, wrestling with your younger brother, somebody who's younger than you that you can easily be, you can easily take advantage of if you know that. And so you, you can't do that, right? You, you sort of have to hold yourself to a higher standard to make sure that that doesn't happen. This is the same reason why I get so irritated when cops do bad things because it's like, hey, we give you 
total power, a total monopoly to do whatever you want. You got a badge and a gun. You went through special training. You've got a total, you know, you got all the money in the world. You have a ton of, of backup anywhere you want. And so you've got special privileges that other people don't. So when you breach the law, when you violate the same law that you were sworn to uphold, I got a huge problem with that. It is sort of a somebody in a position of power dumping all over somebody that doesn't. I don't like bullies and I don't like being in a situation where you know people are taking advantage of other people. It drives me bananas. That's why I'm a defense attorney because our US government, our federal state governments do that all day long every day. But Michael Avenatti did it as well. So he has a special level of disdain coming from me. So I, I, don't, I don't appreciate you know, anything that he's done. I don't appreciate his political uh, perspectives or the spectacle that we saw from him. I also don't like you know, how the media treated him. But there also is a little bit of humanity left when somebody goes to prison for two and a half years. When somebody goes into custody, it's a thing that happens and people will break. So we got to have a little bit of humanity there as we go through this. Now, that being said, there's a brilliant philosopher who once said, true happiness is seeing your neighbor fall off their roof. Michael Avenatti just fell off the roof. And a lot of people in the media also fell off the roof. Remember this one? He's Donald Trump's worst nightmare. Michael <laughs> Avenatti. Joining us once again is Michael Avenatti. Let's bring in Michael Avenatti. Michael Avenatti. Michael Avenatti. Michael Avenatti, thank you very much. He's out there saving the <laughs> Look, country. It, it, Don Meacham says he may be the savior of the republic. You are something of a folk hero now. I owe Michael Avenatti an apology. I've been saying enough for writing, Michael. I've seen you everywhere. What do you have left to say? I was wrong, brother. You have a lot to say. I uh, am just dying to hear what you think. These people all like you. I'm the only person right here Donald Trump fears more than Robert Miller. We think you guys are the tip of the spear that's going to take down Donald Trump. Right. Michael, Michael right, so is a beast. Yep. We're going we're gonna to continue on with this clip, but I forgot to mention, listen to the very last couple seconds of this clip. I've played this clip before, but not in its entirety. We're going to pause. Just listen to the last thing that he says. So we're going to go through the clip. He's going to finish, and then we're going to see this splash frame. I think it's from Free Beacon. And then there's one final clip from Mr. Avenatti. Let's listen. See what that is. Okay, that's true. And he, he's a beast. He's a beast. I hand it to yeah. her, and I hand it to Michael Avenatti. But he has a great, bigger calling here. That being a lawyer is minimal compared to what he's doing. No one has talked tougher directly to Donald Trump on TV than Michael Avenatti. And Donald Trump is afraid to mention his name. That's fascinating. Donald Trump is terrified of Michael Avenatti. Yeah. Yeah. Does Trump will run for his money more than anybody <laughs> else, Michael Avenatti? An existential threat to the Trump presidency. The Democrats could learn something for you. You are messing with Trump a lot more than they are. He has no doubt created sheer panic in Donald Trump's very fragile mind. Michael Avenatti is laying down the law as mm. guest co-host. And is he really thinking about running for president? Uh, one reason why I'm taking you seriously as a contender is because of your presence on cable news. You look at the field of Democrats right now and Avenatti's the one who stands out. If they decide they value a fighter most, yes. people would be foolish to underestimate yeah. Michael Avenatti. I have always said that they need a fighter. Look, I mean, we're going to continue to use the media. I think we've used it with great success. Wait for it. Here it comes. Here it comes. All of my sexual fantasies involve handcuffs. Oh. oh. Well, Mr. Avenatti, well, unfortunately, uh, you're going to get to experience those. You did today, in fact, two and a half years in prison for extortion, according to the AP. So Michael Avenatti, the brash California lawyer who represented Stormy Daniels in the lawsuit against President Trump, sentenced two and a half years for trying to extort $25 million dollars from Nike by threatening them with bad publicity. So he's 50 years old, convicted last year uh, of charges, including attempted extortion and honest of honest services based on a representation of an LA youth basketball league who was upset that Nike had ended its league sponsorship. So, so in LA youth basketball, they're mad. They go to uh, Avenatti. He calls Nike and then tries to extort them. U.S. District Judge Paul G. Gardefi called Avenatti's conduct outrageous, saying, quote, he hijacked his client's claims and used those claims to further his own agenda, which was to extort millions of dollars from Nike for himself. And so in federal court during the sentencing proceeding, you really, you can't have audio or video, so we can't 
you know, check in on any of this stuff. But the, I did poke around Twitter and some people were doing the live tweeting thing. So we're going to poke around and just want to show you some of the things that I saw. Here is Jerry Dunleavy. Okay. Now he is over there saying that Michael Avenatti is crying in the courtroom during his speech before sentencing, right? He says the, and so of course that, that caught a lot of attention and a lot of journalists were, were listening to that and they go, oh my gosh, he's, he's bawling his eyes out in there. What the heck's going on? So, you know, that was spreading around and a lot of people are saying, oh, well, Mr. Tough Guy, huh? Okay. Yeah. How about that there? Not so fun, is it? You know? And so I understand wanting to spike the football. I get it. I know it's fun and it's, oh yeah, you know, kind of feels good from time to time, but as I said, this is a big thing, right? He's going to prison for two and a half years. And you might think that's well warranted. Maybe you do. Maybe it is. That doesn't take away from the importance of what happened. It's a, it's a big thing when that happens to anybody. And we don't want to sort of skate over that. All right. So Jerry Dunleavy says, the judge is now calmly reading Avenatti's F word laden. Nike extortion rants. These were secretly recorded by the FBI into the record before sentencing. So what does that mean? <laughs> the judge, the judge was sort of skewering him a little bit. You know, the knife's kind of in there and he's kind of twisting it a little bit. So Avenatti comes up there and he's like, judge, uh, bawling his eyes out. I'm sorry. And we're going to hear some of what he said. And then the judge says, huh? Okay. Well, how about this? Pulls out the transcript and just says, oh, Avenatti said, uh, give me the effing, 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 effing this. Okay. Now next Line, judge, effing, you know, all, all and on and on. So Avenatti's sitting there going, yeah, I said that. Yep, said that too. Yep, said that too. And so after his sentencing, where he's, you know, probably doing this whole, you know, I'm really sorry routine, then the judge comes back out and says, well, why'd you do that then? That doesn't make any sense. And so when that happens, you would tend to think that the judge would be coming down with a very harsh sentence. They're going to just say, well, I don't like this. And so we're going to make sure this slams hard. We'll see if the judge did that in fact. Now, as I mentioned, Cernovich was out there and he got this right. He says, listen, take no joy in Avenatti's breakdown in court. Rejoicing in suffering is how demons enter you. Avenatti was an evil man pr promoted by every major corporate media outlet. They collaborated with and they promoted disinformation. God is evening the ledger. <sighs> There's a reason people follow Cernovich. That's a powerful tweet right there. And I think he's, he's, he's right, right? Avenatti, we've seen the media do this. They just sort of use people. They're disposable. They just bring them up. Oh, Avenatti, he's got a loud mouth and he's very aggressive. And we like what he says. We like his style. So they put him on every single show, just like I played in that montage earlier, where they're just milking this for everything. And you see them do this all over, all over the place, right? It's the same routine. Avenatti's not useful to them anymore. Just right in the garbage. Gone. Right. And this happens, my friends, with a lot of the stories we talk about here it happens with Breonna Taylor. It just happened with George Floyd. OK, he, Chauvin was convicted, all of that stuff. Right. Is there going to be any changes? Not that I've seen. We've seen the George Floyd bill still just getting kicked around over there and uh, nothing's going to happen. Joe Biden set a deadline. I think it was May 25th. Gone and gone. Came and came and went. Gone. So everybody just jumps on it. Right. And regardless of what you think about George Floyd, there were a lot of people talking about that case and saying specifically that, oh, this is going to be the impetus for change. We're all going to defund the police and do all of this stuff. And then now we're just we're seeing, well, there's a crime wave. And in fact, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, the two biggest law enforcement advocates in the history of the country are out there saying, well, we got an extra three hundred and fifty billion dollars now for uh, local law enforcement. So George Floyd was just a convenient name, somebody that did, didn't really matter much at all. It was just useful for the time. It was very useful during the election season. Got a lot of people riled up and all vitriolic and amped up to go out there and vote against an evil racist warmonger named Donald Trump. And now they can suddenly uh, uh, kind of do the same thing here with Avenatti. Oh, well, he, he, was, he was useful until he wasn't anymore, right in the garbage, which is just, it's reprehensible that they do that to people. Uh, you, you'd imagine that there would be a, a little bit more, I, I would say, I guess, I guess integrity, right? If, if you believe in something, if you're going to get on the internet and get on news and get on media all the time and sort of, you know, advocate for something, Michael Avenatti is the best in the world. We heard that from everybody. And now he's like, oh, whoop, whoop. Sorry about that. So uh, anyways, so uh, Cernovich is out here. Yeah, Avenatti's, you know, a piece of garbage. But at the same time, if you sort of really take pleasure in somebody else's suffering or their downfall, what does that do? It just sort of invites that in into your heart. And so we try to, you know, have humanity 
especially when you're at the end of the line. Okay, Avenatti's at the end of the line. It's over for him. So at this moment, spiking the football might feel good, but it really, I don't know how necessary it is. Okay, let's go back to the article. Avenatti said that the judge added that he had become drunk on the power of his platform is true, which the media gave him and they exploited it, or what he perceived the power of his platform to be, right? Not so powerful. He had be become someone who operated as if the laws and the rules that applied to everyone else didn't apply to him. Criminal fraud charges on two coasts disrupted Avenatti's rapid ascent to fame. He faces the start of a fraud trial next week in Los Angeles, which we're going to look at here shortly. This is a second California criminal trial. Uh, there was another one in California later this year and a separate trial next year in Manhattan where he's charged with cheating Daniels out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. So when I say he's at the end of the line, I, I mean, I meant that, right? He's not just done. This happened in New York. He's going back to California, criminal trial next week, going back out next year for uh, another one in California, then back out next year to another one in Manhattan. So they're just going to keep stacking these charges on top of him. He has become no longer useful, and so he is now expendable. So Avenatti then is a, represented, as we all know, Stormy Daniels in 2018, lawsuits against Donald Trump. He explored running against Trump in 2020, boasting that he would have no problem raising money. Daniels said that a tryst with Trump, we remember all of that, the political aspirations evaporated when prosecutors in California and New York charged Avenatti with fraud. March 2019, California prosecutors said he was enjoying a $200,000 a month lifestyle, a month, my friends, a month while cheating clients out of millions of dollars and failing to pay hundreds of thousands to the IRS. So uh, all of those are very disgusting things, cheating his own clients out of millions of dollars while living on a $200,000 a month lifestyle. That's a lot of money every month. Wow. So yeah, that's a lot. Wow. What do you get for that? <sighs> Anyways, okay, I was going to make a Stormy Daniels comment on that, but I'm going to going to hold myself back on that one. Okay, so what else happened in court today? Of course, here's Dev Devlin Barrett, who is a Washington Post reporter. He covers the FBI DOJ. He was there listening in. He said, look, uh, the, the judge... Uh, here's what Avenatti said. So, of course, we can't get recordings of this, but this is what he says that Avenatti said. He said, TV and Twitter, Your Honor, mean nothing. He said, Avenatti is crying, thanking his family for standing by him. He says, quote, I and I alone have destroyed my career, my relationships, my life. And there is no doubt that I deserve to pay, have paid, and will pay a further price for what I have done. Okay, so look, at, at a moment like that, I, I take him for his word on that. I, I know, I know many people probably don't agree with that. But at that moment, it's the end of the line. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt on that one. The judge has already said he calculates the sentencing guidelines for Avenatti at somewhere between nine and 11 years. Okay, so keep a pin in that one, nine and 11 years. The judge is now recounting the factual history of the Nike shakedown. Usually not a great sign for a defendant when the judge keeps quoting him saying, I'm not effing around in quotes, right? He keeps saying it over and over, I'm not effing around, give me the money, I'm not effing around Nike, I'm not effing around, we'll do it. Judges kept saying it over and over again. The judge said, Mr. Avenatti's conduct was outrageous, hijacked his clients. We already read that one. Mr. Avenatti said became drunk with power, so the rules didn't apply to him. The judge hammers the lawyer, Mark Garagos, and implicitly rebukes the Justice Department for not charging him a different lawyer. The judge says, why didn't Mark Garagos get charged? Garagos, the judge said, suffered no consequences as a result of his conduct, and he was a central figure in the criminal conduct. Right? Right? So the question then becomes, right, is this a political prosecution? Why is Avenatti getting prosecuted but not Mark Garagos? Judge wants to know. I think it's a good question, right? I don't support political prosecutions either way. Avenatti, not a good, not a good man at all, a terrible lawyer, does damage to the to the reputation of the entire industry. And any lawyer that does that should be reprimanded and scolded and run right out of the, the profession, in my opinion. And still does not deserve a political prosecution because I keep saying this. When that happens, the pendulum swings the other way. If you're going to be doing cartwheels because Avenatti got politically prosecuted, well, they're doing it right now to all the Capitol Hill defendants, and the pendulum swings the other way, as we say here. Wow, says Devlin Barrett. He says the judge drastically departs downwardly and gives Avenatti three years in prison on this case, saying it's not justice 
for Mr. Avenatti to be sentenced to 9 to 11 years when Mr. Garagos was not even charged. Huh. So the judge is saying your compatriot over there didn't get charged. So I can't give you 9 to 11 when he gets zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce yours down to two and a half. Down from nine years. So maybe you might say, well, maybe if this is a political prosecution, he got kind of a hell of a deal, didn't he? Nine years down to, or up to 11, down to two and a half. That's a smoking deal. I wonder if some of the Capitol Hill people would get that same benefit in a situation like this. Or what if would a Trumper get the same benefit? Okay, we know Michael Flynn sat in custody for a long time. Devlin Barrett, a potential nine-year prison sentence for Avenatti was reduced to 2.5. The kind of sentencing break usually reserved for those who flip and provide evidence. The judge was greatly displeased that Garagos walked away from the case scot-free. Big, big departure. Major break. And there's another attorney here on Twitter who also is sort of concurring with that. Adriana Lawrence says prosecutors asked the court to give Avenatti eight years or nine to 11. So a sentence of 30 months is rather light handed, particularly given that he's an attorney and was convicted of extortion, wire fraud and a related offense. And so the reason I clipped that right is to just hammer that point home. If you're an attorney, if you're somebody in a position of power, you take an extra oath to get sworn in. And you've got a big problem if you commit a crime that is a dishonest crime. It is something that is looked upon more disfavorably because now we're questioning your morality, right? If you are somebody that gets a DUI, you're a lawyer, you get a DUI, okay, well, maybe you're an alcoholic, right? Maybe you're somebody that just has an addiction problem. Maybe this was just a mistake. But if you're actually extorting somebody and you're wire frauding stuff and you're trying to sort of, in a dishonest manner, take things from other people, that's a crime of, 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 of dishonesty, which is very problematic because people need to trust you because you're a lawyer. You have, you have outsized power over their estates, for example, or th- their, the custody of their kids, or in our case, their freedoms, whether they go to prison or not. So if they entrust us with that, it is a sacred thing that we have to protect to the end of the earth. And, and Michael Avenatti didn't. People trusted him and he just extorted them and committed wire fraud. So, uh, you know, three years for that, it does feel light. Now, to be fair, Adriana Lawrence says, well, but his legal issues are far from over. He still faced a host of tax and bank charges in California. Trial set to begin next week in federal court. And next year, Avenatti returns to New York for another federal trial on charges that he embezzled money from Stormy Daniels. Right. So this guy is going to be bounced around the system for some period of time. And, you know, he's he's not somebody undeserving of that. So I wanna show you quickly, we've got three more slides in this segment from uh, the case against Michael Avenatti that is still taking place in California. So, you know, uh, he's presumably getting ready to pack up and head over here because trial starts on July 13th. Unless there's any additional continuances, Avenatti is scheduled for trial, like literally next week. So let's take a look at the government's trial memorandum. I wanna show you this. Fairly briefly, this was filed July 7th, 25 pages. We're not going to go through the entirety of it. This is the government's trial memorandum. Okay, so it's a memorandum on counts 1 to 10. They're noting here that the trial starts July 13th, 8 a.m., courtroom of James Selna, Honorable James Selna, United States versus Michael John Avenatti in the Central District of California. So this is taking place over there. And what they're saying is they're, they're giving us a trial memorandum. And a, and a memo is just sort of an... Uh, that's a memo, right? It's a memorandum. It is a, a sort of a briefing about what's taking place in the trial. The judge doesn't really know what's going on. The judge says, okay, prosecutors, I need you to tell us about what happened here. What are the facts? What do you intend to prove? Do you have any problems that we need to address? Did they not disclose anything? Are you missing anything? Who are your witnesses? How much time do you need? Who are you call in and who you might call in? Whatever. All the mechanics all the technicalities. We spent a lot of time on this channel talking about that during the Derek Chauvin trial, all the motions in limine, what can the officer say and not say? And so kind of the list goes on and on. Now, the the government in this memo is saying, here, judge, this is what we've got for you. And let's take a look at the table of contents and see what's inside. So they tell us first and foremost, we got an introduction, which we just saw. They define the embezzlement counts And then we'll note that they have a statement of facts for four different victims. We have Michelle Fon, we have Gregory Barella, we have Alexis Gardner, and we have Jeffrey Johnson. So they're saying that not only did he embezzle funds, he did it from four people. 
Okay, four different times, four different occasions. They go through the elements of the offense. They go through the legal and evidentiary issues. So they talk about whether there were you know admissions made that were authorized or uh, made by agencies, whether the government has identified for the defense business, business records that it intends to introduce at trial. So this is an evidentiary issue. Can this business record ever come into court, right? They might argue over that. Cross-examination of the defendant. Is Michael Avenatti gonna be testifying or is he gonna be cross, is subject to cross-examination? Are they gonna redact anything from any of the trial exhibits so that it doesn't become part of uh, what the jury sees? Are they gonna be impeaching anybody? Uh, how about the, the defendant's other fraud charges? The government wants to address that. They also wanna address the lack of reciprocal discovery or affirmative defenses saying that, hey, you know, we're, we're the government. We gave Avenatti and his team a lot of information, but they're not reciprocating. They're not giving that data back to us. And then other privilege issues that the defendant may attempt to raise, of course, you know, like, like the right against self-incrimination and things like that. Maybe they're going to want to address that. So it's a 25 page memo and they go through and they just sort of lay all of that out there. We're not going to go through the entirety for the sake of time. But of course, I want to show you just a, a, a snippet from the introduction and then the statement of facts so you can see what kind of conduct they're alleging occurred here. The memorandum of points and authorities, we have the introduction. So the jury trial on the severed client embezzlement counts, which means that they're just going forward on just the embezzlement counts. So there must be other charges. It starts July 13th. Jury selection begins at 8 a.m. Opening statements followed by the government's case in chief are going to begin on July 20th at 8.30. The government says they need three weeks for its case, including jury selection. The government is going to call 30 witnesses. The defendant is currently on temporary release pending trial, but probably not anymore. Probably now in custody because he has been sentenced and uh, they take you into custody at that time. So now let's take a look at the facts. Trial's coming up. Jury selection is going to start. Oh, uh, the case in chief starts July 20th. So maybe we'll continue to follow this. We'll see what is going on in the case, though. Let's see what's happening here. So the statement of facts, the evidence at trial will prove the following, according to the government. This is what we're going to show, they say. Between January, 15, January 2015 and March 2019, so about four years, defendant was licensed in California. He defrauded five people. We talked about them. Jeffrey, Alexis, Gregory, Michelle, Long. And he stole almost $10 million dollars in settlement funds that belong to them. How do you do it? Well, it was pretty simple. First, he would negotiate on behalf of a client, a settlement that would require the payment of the funds to the client. Then he would misrepresent, conceal, falsely describe to the client the true terms of the settlement or the disposition of the proceeds. Next, he would cause the proceeds to be deposited into a bank account that the defendant controlled. He would then embezzle and misappropriate the proceeds to which he was not entitled. Then he would lull the client to prevent the client from discovering his embezzlement and misappropriation by other things, falsely denying that the settlement proceeds had been paid, sending funds to the client under the false pretense that such funds were advances on the purportedly yet to be received settlement proceeds and then falsely claimed that a payment of the settlement proceeds had been delayed for legitimate reasons and would occur at a later time. Oh my goodness. This guy is just the worst. So what he's doing is, <laughs> let's say he, rep he sues somebody, okay? So he's a Stormy Daniels attorney, right? He represents her and he sues Donald Trump and they settle the case. I think Trump paid $150,000 to settle that claim. So he didn't do this with Stormy, but he did it with four other people in California. So he goes and he's negotiating with the Trump organization. Okay, well, we're going to settle it. Well, we want a quarter million. Nope, we'll give you 75. They settle on 150. So then Avenatti goes back to his client and says, great news. We got a, an amazing settlement. You're going to be getting $100,000. The client goes, well, that's great. You think that's as good as we can do? Well, you know, I, I've been working hard. They wanted to give us 75, but I bumped it up to 100. And so now I think we're good. We should take this deal. Client goes, that's great. You're a great lawyer. Uh, Brian Stelter loves you. Wow, this is amazing. And then Avenatti slowly, you know, through this uh, dis disbursement and advancing and all of that stuff is sort of irrelevant. He's sending money over there and, you know, they start cashing these checks and then they start poking around and saying, yeah, but, uh, huh. I, I, it, it, I, I, it might, might be us, but I think you settled that for 150,000 and you only gave us a hundred. So what happened to the remaining 50? Huh? 
and Avenatti's, well, no, and he's moving money around and advancing them some other things. And we didn't get it yet. And we didn't do this and all this stuff. Meanwhile, he's living on a $200,000 a month lifestyle. Where's that money going? Somebody found out about it. And now he is getting uh, charged with new crimes in California. Probably going to be convicted on those as well. Not a good thing. I know a lot of attorneys that are very, very sloppy with their money and they sort, you know, it's not good and it's very dishonest. And so that should be addressed as it will be. Okay, great stuff. Let's take a look at over over at the uh, chat at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Let's see if we've got any questions in the house. We got a good one here from Jack Elia says, uh, Robert, everyone is, cap is, take is capable of taking advantage of their specialization to extort or swindle someone else. In my opinion, if a jury of peers is possible, then the sentencing for all persons must be equal without regard to occupation, race, sex, color, ethnicity, religion, disability, veteran status, or we are not a nation of peers. We are a caste nation where status may be legislated into segregated treatment under the law by category. Yeah, very interesting question. So, you know, this is a, this is a very good debate, Jack Alaya, and I think that this is an astute point that you're making, right? This is something that we've been talking about in criminal law for all, for, for, forever, essentially. Do you standardize justice or do you make it responsive to the defendant in front of you? There are pros and cons of both. If you make it standardized, then everybody gets the same penalty. The problem with that is that there are oftentimes, I would say most of the time, exceptions to the rule. Okay. And, and quite frankly, our legislature, uh, legislators, the people who write the criminal laws are morons, actually. So they don't really know what they're doing. And they will write these laws in different ways that have all these exceptions and all sorts of things. And so we get clients and they come in and they say, well, the mandatory sentence is this. And we say, I know it is, but that's not appropriate. And here's why mother, two kids going to be deported or whatever, right? The whole thing turns into a big thing. And, and, if you did impose that mandatory sentence that is equal to everybody, it really would not feel just for that one person. And believe me when I tell you this, this is very common. And we have a lot of lunatic uh, elected officials out there that the only thing they want to do every year is just make the criminal law harsher. That's it. That's the only thing. Tough on crime. I'm a sheriff, whatever. And that's the only thing that they do. And so if you have just sort of a, a an equal penalty across the board, no matter what, then you're going to get a lot of people overly punished that probably shouldn't be the opposite of that of course on the other end of the spectrum is that you don't have mandatory sentencing you don't have these three strikes rules you don't have what joe biden did where if you get a first offense crack cocaine violation it's five years prison right you get that's what happens when that happens i don't care what color you are i don't care cracks a problem five years everybody goes yeah great violence we don't like drug violence okay and so now you've got you know, a lot of people whose lives are ruined over that thing. And that's mandatory sentencing. Everybody gets that. So it can be a big problem. On the other side, though, then you have sort of a responsive type of sentencing where every defendant comes through. You, 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 you ideally want to say, well, we're going to give this person a fair shake. Rob Gruler's here. And here's what he's being charged with. And here's what he does. And here's why maybe we should work the penalty down. And the government comes and says, maybe this is why we should work the penalty up. And we're going to make it responsive to the unique individual. Well, what does that mean? Well, that op opens up a lot of room for variables to come into play and and some subjective interpretation of the events and so one judge might look at me sitting there as a defendant oh, please show me mercy saying you're right i appreciate you rob i appreciate this and i appreciate this and thank you you've shown yourself to be remorseful and we're going to give you a low penalty and another judge might say oh, no that's you're, you're the worst and what i saw from you and what i heard from you doesn't resonate with me and therefore i'm going to give you the maximum penalty and if you take that same sort of dichotomy now, and then you introduce a racial element to that, then it becomes a huge problem and legitimately, right? Now, if you have, and this has historically happened in this country, where you'll have a certain racial demographic that gets a more severe penalty than another racial demographic. And so that causes everybody to start to say, oh, well, we need mandatory penalties then from everybody across the board. And so that's where we're at now. We've got the three strikes. We've got mandatory minimums. We've got Joe Biden's, you know, crime bill from 1994 that is still sort of enmeshed throughout our entire country. And people are having this debate left and right. It's a great question. I don't know that we're going to get an answer to it because there are there are problems with both both approaches. Great question, though. Let's see what else we have here. We've got 
A uh, couple other ones. Azizi's in the house. Joe Snow's here. We've got Jack Elias here. Let's see if we've got any other questions. Oh, that one Florida man is here. Good to see you. That one Florida man says, everyone should check out a YouTube of Joe Rogan and Alex Jones. Out of context edits are hilarious. So that's funny. Um, so Joe Rogan I just saw was over on... Oh, no, I just read an article that the Spotify people are very angry with Joe Rogan. Norovirus here says, hmm, Jack Elias says, no mercy for Robert. He will be face palmed with a cream pie. Looking forward to that. That's going to be fun. We have Be Brave says it stops. Okay, so great questions. All of those over from watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Looking forward to that cream pie, cream pie Jack Elias. That's going to be fun. Now, if you hit somebody in the face with a cream pie, and they don't want to be hit in the face with a cream by, that is probably going to be an assault charge. And so if you happen to know somebody like Jack Elia, who is cream pieing people in the face, well, uh, you might need some criminal representation. Our law firm, the R&R Law Group, can help with that. Our mission is to provide safety, clarity, and hope to good people facing criminal charges, including the pie throwers. We have a free consultation that is available, and our phone number is 480-787-0394, also online, rrlawaz.com. You can take a picture of this QR code, and it's going to take you right over to the website where you can schedule online. We have an awesome team of people. We look forward to helping you with any type of criminal charge that you're facing in the state of Arizona, things like DUIs, drug offenses, misdemeanor, traffic violations, and everything and anything in between. If you don't need any help, I'd invite you to go check out some of my offerings over at gumroad.com slash Robert Gruller. In particular, the law enforcement interaction training, which is available now, $19, and it's two and a half hours. It gives you the one, two, three rule for dealing with law enforcement. It's the one rule you need. It's the two questions that you have to answer, and it's three powerful responses, kind of like a one-two combo that you can send back out towards their way verbally. It's verbal judo, not uh, physical. That might help you uh, escape criminal liability when the government is trying to make you a criminal. So check that out at gumroad.com slash Robert Grueler. All right, we're going to change gears and wrap up the final segment of the day. Hunter Biden is America's latest artist. He's going to be showing us really what's inside his heart and his soul. And we're going to take a look at some of these pictures from him very shortly. Now, this is not an art channel. This is not a Hunter Biden channel. We have talked about Hunter Biden previously here, but this is a bigger issue because the question is now coming up whether or not this is an ethical problem because Hunter Biden, who is this newfound artist, is selling his artwork for prices as high as half a million dollars, huh? which is uh, curious because we have some history with Hunter Biden. We know that he was on uh, you know, different boards, different, different organizations around the country with very little experience about things like oil and sort of international relations. The allegations back during the election that most of the people in the media never even talked about or covered. We talked about Tony Bobulinski and all of these things. And it was all just kind of swept under the rug. Nobody wanted to talk about that laptop with all of these you know, bad things happening on there, even though this was the president's son. This was somebody at, where there were some improprieties that were being alleged that Hunter Biden, back when Joe Biden was the vice president of this country, was using his father's stature to influence a prosecution taking place in the Ukraine involving a company called Burisma. So a lot of improprieties are floating around. Everybody's been talking about it for some time. Everybody that really knows what's going on knows how this thing works. But the Biden administration, because they are now in power, well, they can't keep that grift up. So they got to come up with something new. Their solution, the White House is now going to get involved with setting up these art sales. Hunter Biden selling his artwork for his prices as high as $500,000. And so we're going to take a look at some artwork here in this segment. I've actually got, I actually have some pieces of his that I like. I wouldn't pay $500,000 for him, probably not even $500 for him, but it is still uh, something that I think is, is pretty good. Now, he also has some artwork on here that kind of looks like, uh, I don't know, sexually transmitted diseases. I don't know. We'll, we'll take a look at it. We'll, we'll see what they are. You can tell me what you think they are. And let's get into the story. All right. First and foremost, some background from the Washington Post. This is what they are writing. They say the deal of the art. Isn't that clever? They're so clever over there. The White House grapples with the ethics of Hunter Biden's pricey paintings. Yep. Updated that today. They say that specifically White House officials, they have helped craft an agreement under which purchases of the Hunter's artwork will be kept confidential. Let me just pause on that. 
the White House officials, they are involved in this, okay? They are helping to craft an agreement. So it's not like Hunter's just doing this. The White House is actively involved. Hunter Biden's artwork purchases, which could be listed as prices as high as 500 grand, will be kept confidential from even the artist himself in an attempt to avoid ethical issues that could arise as the presidential family tries to sell a product with a highly subjective value, right? You really can't, how, how do you price art? It's a complicated thing. So $500,000 kind of seems like a nice starting point. All right. Under an arrangement that was negotiated in recent months, a New York gallery owner is planning to set prices for the art. We're going to take a look at this guy, George Burgess. He said that it, it's, he's going to withhold all records. He's going to also hide all potential bidders and the final buyers. He's agreed to reject any offer that he thinks is suspicious. Anything that comes over the asking price, say people according to People are f familiar with the agreement. All right, so this guy, George S. Burgess, which is just perfect. George S. Burgess, which is, is that real? Did he, did he make that up? Here, here is his uh, gallery. This is a screenshot from the George S. Burgess gallery, which is just fancy. New York and Berlin, we can see those over here. And they have a list of their artists up here. So this was established in 2015. GBG prides itself on introducing collectors to the art and artists that will come to define tomorrow's art world. All right, so that sounds pretty nice. Let's see who is uh, over here as a part of this gallery. Oh, well, look at that. We have Hunter Biden right, right there on top. And in fact, if you click the Our Artist segment here, uh, you're going to see a lot of different names on here. And Hunter Biden is right at the top, my friends. And at first, I thought that maybe this was like an alphabetical thing, but I don't think so. We've got Laddie John Dill over here. So I, you know, it's a D and an L. And then we got Ford Krull, which is a F and a C. And then we got Hunter Biden. So I think this is sort of like a... I don't know, maybe seniority or something. I don't, I don't know unless I'm missing something. But they put Hunter Biden right here at the front, right at top. And so my question was, man, like these other people look like artists. Hunter Biden, he's got a black and white photo. I guess that's kind of artisty. I don't, you know, I don't know. But he's, uh, he's also an artist now. So I said, wow, I wonder what it takes to be an artist that makes five hundred thousand dollars for a painting. Maybe I'll pick a different career, right? I can. I can paint pictures of STDs, and Hunter Biden is also uh, is is also somebody who does that. So let's see what's going on here. Now let's take a look at the other artists, right? The other artists. We're gonna we're gonna pay attention to these people. We have Laddie John Dill, who is kind of number one on this list. We have Ford Krull, who also looks like an artist, and we also have Hunter Biden. So let's do a, a, just a quick compare and contrast between these three people. Let's see what you know artists look like in terms of their resumes. First, we have Laddie John Dill. And we're not going to read this bio, it doesn't really matter, but he's got a lot of stuff here, right? He's born in 1943. And if you click this, you're going to see right here, you can download his CV, which is which is you know very convenient. So you just click on his profile, download the CV. You can even just park, purchase artwork if you want. Now, he's been with this organization for some time. And so if you, if you actually click his CV, here's what it looks like. This is only three of the five pages that he's got. So he's been, uh, you know, uh, Sana Ben Gallery 72 is when he first started. In 1978, he was at the Landfill Press. At uh, 1981, he was at Thomas Balboa Gallery in La Jolla, Joya, California. We've got New York in, uh, in 1986. When I was born, he was over in San Jose and then also in La, La, La Joya, I think is how you say that. Then over here in 1988, let's see, Cypress College, 2000, so he's, you know, 1972 up to 2000, he's over in the Euro Gallery, makes his way over to Minnesota, back to New York in 2013, and then he's been just kind of select exhibits, 2017, 2016 over here, different awards and honors, and he went to a, an actual art institute over in LA. So he currently lives in Venice Beach in California, and uh, you know, I mean, man, that's a, like, like that feels like an artist to me. That's, man, that's solid, right? Solid resume. Okay, so if somebody, if I was, uh, hiring an artist, I'd say, Oh, I, yeah, schedule him for an interview. Okay. That's, that's a lot there. Let's see who else we've got. We've got Ford Krull over here. So, uh, you'll also notice that this guy, you know, he's got, he's standing in front of a painting here, probably his, and he, you can also see that Ford Krull also, you can download his CV as well. So he's got a big bio over here, all this stuff. So if we want to click over on his uh, CV, Oh my gosh. Wow another great candidate. So this guy, let's see, he goes back to 1991. 
and he's got an imagery series in New York. Then we fast forward to 2000, so about nine years later, he's been, been, been being an artist. He's over in Idaho. Then in 2010, he's still in Idaho, but he's also in 2009 in Washington and uh, done some other things. And then we have select group exhibits all the way from 2011 to 2015, and then he works from 1979 to 2004. So a long time, over 30-something 30, 30 years, I think. And now we've got solo exhibitions over here uh, as recently as 2000. 2015 and a big CV, big bio. So man, it's like, uh, I don't know who to, who to choose if I'm hiring an artist. I don't know who to add because this guy's got 1991, probably the, the other guy. He's been doing it a lot longer, 1972, but you know, who knows? Very, very impressive resumes. Okay. So now we know sort of what the, the one and two people look like at the George S. Burgess uh, gallery. And now we can see what Hunter Biden's uh, resume looks like. Oh, so here's Hunter Biden over here. And oh, oh, well, there's, there's nothing to click right here, is there? There's no CV here. Huh. Well, that's kind of strange. So we can't actually see any of his experience, but let's just see what they're telling us. Biden has been a lifelong artist. <laughs> Okay, great. So there you go. Uh, he has devoted his artistic career, which we don't see anywhere, to both the written word, got it, and the visual arts, which we have seen some visual arts from him. We saw a lot of these in photographic form with prostitutes and hookers from all around the world. Uh, you know, no, no disdain for them. I feel bad for them for having to deal with this guy. A lawyer by trade who now devotes his life to the creative arts, which is nice. He brings a myriad of experiences creating powerful and impactful pieces of art. His painting range from a photographic mix, which we've seen in the media, to abstract works on canvas, Yupo paper, wood and metal. He incorporates oil, acrylic, and ink in the written word of his work to create distinctively unique experiences that have become signature Biden. Hashtag that, my friends. Signature Biden. Yeah, oh, that's signature Biden. Uh, Truman International the Pressure. Signature Biden. Creeping on young gals. Signature Biden. Money laundering with artwork that is mostly garbage, signature Biden. Don't you just love that stuff? Now, if you do want to do a quick analysis on some of these, these, these art pieces, well, of course, you want to look at how you price these things. A couple things you might want to look at first and foremost, the aesthetics of it. Okay, now this is not a deep dive analysis, but we also want to look at the supply and demand mechanisms, right? So like, is the artist alive or dead? because if they're dead, there is no more supply. The pedigree of the artist is another major factor in the artwork, right? That's why we went through and we saw the CV of those other articles. How about the reputation of the art dealer? Oh my goodness, right? What about the art dealer? Think about these other artists at this, at this, at this gallery. They're going, you just brought Hunter Biden on here? Well, I've been painting for 35 years. He's been painting for 10 minutes. What are you talking about? So I would be sort of upset if I was one of them, I, I would guess. Uh, the press, of course. So the press is going to make sure that Hunter Biden gets a lot of press and a lot of money. Uh, art is done during a good or bad period. Also, the condition and the provenance and the context and the level of historical significance. So you kind of go through those eight different factors and you got to you know, do an analysis and see whether one of Hunter Biden's paintings is actually worth $500,000. We're going to get to the paintings here soon. They're coming right up. Before we get there, let's take a look at what's happening here. So the art sale from Joe, uh, for uh, Hunter, is expected to take place this fall. It comes with potential challenges, doesn't it? Not only has Biden previously been accused of trading in on his father's name, but his latest vocation is in a field where works do not have a tangible fixed value. And concerns have arisen about secretive buyers and undisclosed sums. Right? Because if somebody says, somebody goes and says, hey, I want your painting for 500 grand, and you say, well, I've been only painting for a year and I really have no experience and it's actually pretty ugly painting, but that sounds good. I'll take it. And, and who's to argue with that? Because that person subjectively says that the painting is worth that. Okay. Officials close to president Biden who have helped to craft the agreement along with Hunter's attorney have attempted to do so in a way that allows the president's son to pursue a new career while also adhering to the elder Biden's pledge to reverse his predecessor's ethical laxity, especially regarding family members. But the arrangement is drawing detractors, including ethics experts, as well as art critics, who suggest that Hunter Biden's art would never be priced so high if he had a different last name. Yep, Burgess, George S. Burgess, said that the prices for the paintings would range from $75,000 to 500,000 bucks. 
Woo, that's pretty good there for an artist with no CV from the George S. Burgess Gallery in New York, which apparently just takes anybody now. So let me show you what Hunter's doing here. Here's a very, very, uh, a very you know close picture of him just art art artisting it up. And here he is, you know, sort of seated in his studio, which of course um, uh, is 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 just very, just very humanizing, right? He's out there just painting. Now, the gallery in a brief online bio called him a lawyer and didn't mention anything about his relationship to, I guess, the president, as we just read. Some critics have praised Hunter Biden's art. Several contacted the post, uh, the, the post found that the asking prices of 75 grand to 500 were hard to justify. Mark Strauss, who for the past decade has owned a gallery on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, said that among high-end art dealers, nobody would ever start at these prices for someone who has no professional training and has never sold art on the commercial market. Obviously, obviously. He says there has to be a resume that reasonably supports when you get that high. To me, it's pure, how good is it? And what's this artist's potential? What's the resume? On that basis, it would be an entirely different price. But you give it a name like Hunter Biden, maybe they'll get the price. All right. So let's take a look at some of the artwork. You know, I, I referenced maybe what I thought some of these paintings were, but some of them are actually not, like not, not terrible. So let's take a look at this one, right? This one's not, not that terrible. Uh, I would never put this up anywhere near me, but it is something that's, you know, it's not, it's not awful to look at. Um, it, it's... Okay, it, I mean, it's something. We also have this one. This one's not bad, right? I might actually put that up somewhere. I think this, this, this doesn't, look, doesn't look bad. I really don't have much to say about it. I kind of like it. I kind of like abstract art in general. And so this isn't bad. It kind of reminds me of a stained glass kind of painting or uh, it's something, it's not bad. I actually, I actually like that one. Now, there are a couple other styles that Hunter is experimenting with. I think this one is so... I, 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 I think it's a painting, but I don't know if we're looking at a Petri dish either. This might be sort of looking down a microscope lens into some fungi or something that are sort of growing in a Petri dish. I think I left some milk in a fridge one time a little bit too long. And when I looked into it, it kind of looked like this. So I don't, you know, this came over from the New York Post and they said this is another painting from Hunter Biden. And so he posted this on Instagram, which is his sort of fungi... These could also, this could also be like a, I don't know, maybe, maybe a, an HIV sort of snapshot. Like these might be the white blood cells and these might be the, uh, the, this might be the HIV virus that is sort of infecting the white blood cells that is then exploding and then infecting the other cells. So uh, this is why I was referencing maybe the, the sort of the STD work. I don't know. It's either moldy milk or it's an AIDS painting. I don't know, but it's going to be sold for five hundred thousand dollars out there so if you like milk fungus and fungi and and uh stds hunter biden's got one for you now if you don't like that there's another one here that i think this is a uh a stain or something that was spilt i'm I, I, oh no they're telling us that this is a painting of a flower here from hunter biden um a flower which i've never <laughs> i've never seen a flower that looks like quite like that but they're telling us it's a flower. He posted that on Instagram. I, I think it's a stain. I don't know if it is. Uh, it could be a Rorschach test. You know, some there's some psychology books that have things that look like this as well. But these could also be some of the the uh, the HIV AIDS uh, white blood cells as well. I I don't I don't really know uh, what this is either. I don't think it's a flower. But again. Right. You know, we want to we want to help Hunter Biden out a little bit here. If that looks appetizing for you, if you want to put that up in your home, right, right in front of your bed. So you walk home and you, before you lay down to sleep, you go, oh, man, it's a beautiful flower, beautiful flower. Well, then it's available now at the George S. Burgess Gallery in New York. So you can go check that out. And uh, and lastly, if the first two kind of didn't do the STD thing for you, I th I think he really it's hard to be an artist because you get better with time. You're like, have you seen artists when they start working on a human face or like they try to draw a human eyeball? It's hard, right? It's hard to, to get the details just right. So, you know, the first painting may have been, you know, sort of AIDS one. And then we had uh, the, the spilt flower, whatever that was. But he's getting, he's getting better. You can see just day by day. This, my friends, is uh, 
I think this is COVID. This is uh, the masterpiece called COVID. And uh, this art consultant, Martin Galindo, agrees. He says he thought this Hunter Biden, Biden painting looks just like COVID. Right here, he says that in the New York Post. And I think he's right. It's, it's either COVID or like this is the result of his trip to, you know, the brothels where he's got a little bit of everything. I, guess I, I, think, I think this is how he does his HIV. His gonorrhea is probably over here. We've got, uh, you know, chlamydia and some of the other ones just kind of just floating around Hunter Biden's paintings. And, it, you know, bec because of some of the imagery that we saw on the laptop, they're just all ugh, going in together right in one right in one painting there. So, I mean, 500 grand, my friends, that's a steal. You can get that right there. Just just go you go go to the gallery, George S. Burgess. They'll have it for you. So he says that through his attorney, let's see. Yes, let's see what else we have here. Hunter Biden then, through his attorney, they did not respond to an interview request, of course. When asked about the artwork, including the term of sale and the potential ethics concerns, Clark referred those questions to the White House. So his, own, his lawyer says, hey, don't talk to us. Go talk to the White House. So then they go to the White House, and Andrew Bates, the deputy White House press secretary, suggested that buyers confidentiality would ensure the process is ethical, right? Because if, if you don't know that there is somebody who wants to launder money to you, if you don't know the name of that person, then it's suddenly ethical because you don't know who it is. So he says, the president has established the highest ethical standards of any administration in American history. Wow, that's a, that's a nice statement. And his family's commitment to rigorous processes like this is a prime example. So they want to just hide everything, essentially, right? The buyer's confidentiality would ensure ethical. Now, Burgess, the gallery owner, he also did not respond to several requests for comment, but the arrangement was described by two officials familiar with it who spoke on the condition of anonymity. They were not authorized to disclose it publicly. A person, a person who initially said she, will be, she was calling on behalf of Burgess, but then said she couldn't be quoted by name, confirmed that all sales would be kept secret and described any agreement as nothing unusual. Now, some experts, though, are arguing that the best protection against influence seeking would be transparency, not secrecy. That way the public would know whether, say, a lobbyist had paid an exorbitant price. Okay, what happens if Hunter Biden's out doing one of his things that he does regularly and somebody who's a lobbyist, somebody who has a, a little bit of want to get close to him or to get close to the president or to get close to any sort of policy change that might happen? And we all know that Hunter Biden is the smartest person on the planet, according to Joe Biden. He said that. He's the smartest man I know. He's brilliant. Okay. So... If that wanted to happen, if Hunter Biden's out at one of his extracurricular activities, he's out at a bar, he's out at a restaurant and somebody comes up and says, hey there, Hunter, uh, you know, really love that art you got over there. I, uh, I'd, I'd like to buy a, a piece from you, 500,000, no problem at all, happy to do that. But while we're having this conversation, also, just want to let you know about this thing also as well. Okay, just, just, just uh, you, I don't need to hear back from you, don't need to respond to anything, I just want to let you know that this policy is kind of important to me. And I really like your art, like a lot. So whatever you just put out there, you just let me know. Send me an email, I'm gonna buy it. But, but when we're talking, I just wanna also let you know that I don't like that thing that is happening. Anything you can do about that? Oh, don't, 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 don't cross that line, of course. And nobody knows. It's just some guy who just likes art. And Hunter Biden's brilliant. Well, well, he's an artist. Okay. So the officials then helped craft an agreement. They said that if buyers were publicly disclosed, it would restrict interest because the identities of most art pur purchasers are not automatically made to the public. So it's like, I know this is just standard. There is also a secondary market. So even a publicly identified buyer might not be the one who ultimately bought the art. So what they're telling you here, my friends, is that this is basically built for money laundering. And so that's why they're just shoving hunter biden into this thing white house officials probably would be warned against giving that person any preferential treatment if the identity does become public so probably so that's good and they could be discouraged from working with them at all according to a per person familiar with the arrangement so probably would be warned and could be discouraged from working with them but not really that's what's going on right there in the white house hunter biden joe biden the the uh, the most Transparent and accountable administration in history. All right, what a stinking joke. Let's take a look over at some questions 
from watchingthewatchers.locals.com dot com and see what's going on in here we have uh, jack elias says to be honest i feel pity for hunter biden it cannot be easy growing up in the pressure cooker of a political crime family that's true you know it is true i like to make fun of the guy but he's a, he's an addict right i empathize with that i get it but i also don't I, I don't you know just because you're an addict just because you're somebody that has that struggled with some of that stuff doesn't mean you get to be a piece of garbage right that's not an excuse and when people say that well well i was I, you know i was an addict Okay, so you get to be a jerk for 20 years. You get to abuse women for 20 years and sort of, you know, run on the back of, the, of your father's political coattails for 20 years, right? I'm tired of the addict excuse. Okay, I know a lot of addicts that are amazing people and they would never do any of that stuff. So this Hunter by well, you know, the whole thing. It is hard that he is in a, you know, in a in a crime family, no doubt about that. And I think that any kid that kind of grows up in that environment is probably going to be severely damaged. But, uh, you know, but but Hunter Biden is not the white knight that the media is trying to make him out to be thunder seven says this is your brain on crack probably one of his paintings let's see what else we've got kareem says covid does he mean sars cov 2 we have josh sesco says i think i'd rather buy a hitler painting at least his didn't look like it was made by a crackhead <laughs> jack elias says money laundering is a little more class than kim Klasik, says jack Elia. i think she she was running, right? She was running, I think, in Baltimore. Uh, let's see what else we have. Joe Snow says, Rob, don't read mine. All right. Uh, ZZ the Boxing Cat says, Democrats always lift up the grifters. We have three girlies is here. Good to see you. I'm not gas is here. Says, this naked corruption is expected from the Bidens. But where the hell are the Republicans? This is so blatantly obvious, more than Hillary or Obama's $500,000 speaking fees yes the speaking fees yes i forgot about those yeah those are also great right hillary clinton flies in there talks for an hour goes out in front of goldman sachs and says well but, but the muddles off something about foreign policy and something two hundred twenty-five thousand bucks right there right here you go here you go and probably a whole bunch of other benefits for board and hotel and first class and private all this all right now it's just now Hunter, because he can't speak very well, as we know from his interview, he uh, he's just going to just paint. It's even easier. You don't even have to go anywhere. You just draw your STDs on your canvas and somebody will pay 500 grand for them. Good to see you. I'm not gas. Great comment. We have, oh, Hack Consulting says La Jolla for La Jala. So I'll, I'll correct that. Thank you, Hack. We have some other questions. Let's see. Robert Gruler says, uh, no, some, that's my name. Joe Snow says the locals chat is spicy. Tell the YouTubers to get in here. It is spicy. That's why I have to uh, be a little bit, uh, uh, you know, I got to gotta be careful here. We have, who's next? Be Brave says if Hunter's art is legit, can he wait until his dad is no longer president to sell the art? That's a great question. Yeah, that's a good question. Why wouldn't he wait, right? Um, well, I don't know, because he can sell it now. Uh, let's see, we've got... <laughs> We've got, we got some good questions, some spicy stuff going on over there. So we're going to wrap it up my, there, my friends. I want to say thank you to everybody uh, over at the watchingthewatchers.locals.com chat. Good stuff happening over there, YouTube and uh, Facebook and Twitch and Rumble over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com, having some fun in there. And uh, hopefully this new format's working a little bit. I know, I know it's a little bit different not seeing the chats on the screen, but it really uh, sort of makes it a little bit more streamlined. I, I can sort of run the whole show myself. So hopefully that's okay. Before we wrap up this segment, quick reminder, I'm a criminal defense lawyer here at the R&R Law Group. We're located in Scottsdale, Arizona. We are extremely passionate about helping good people facing criminal charges. That's what we, that's what we do. You know, every day we get on this channel and I want to make sure that we are addressing things from the public facing perspective, but we also have to recognize that there are many people who are in the system that need our help. And we've got a whole team of people that we wake up and we, that's it. Boom. Grind it out every day to make sure that we are getting people the results they deserve because we want to help them get their lives back on the right path. And the system is not set up to do that. So our mission is to help good people find safety, clarity, and hope in their cases and beyond that in their lives. If you know anybody in the state of Arizona that is facing a criminal charge, 
We would love the opportunity to help. The phone number here, 480-787-0394, also available online by taking a picture of that QR code or visiting rrlawaz.com. You can also schedule a free case evaluation online as well. We would love the opportunity to help. If you don't need legal services, very, very good news. You may want to make sure that you prevent the need for legal services by getting my law enforcement interaction training, which is a two and a half hour program that will teach you how to deal with the police during an interaction. It's the one, two, three rule. There's only one rule you need to rem remember. It's this. There are two questions that the police can ask you, and there are three responses that you can fire back if they're asking you an unapproved question. So go check that out at gumroad.com slash Robert Grueler. Quick reminder, we had some new members who signed up yesterday. I'm going to update this for tomorrow, but quick shout out to all of you who signed up yesterday, including that one Florida man and realtor Patty who signed up over there for the year. So they're going to be with us for a while. And welcome also to Copper Lobo, Justice Obsessed and Chop. And there were others. I'm going to update this list tomorrow. But if you'd like to join, the place to do that is at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Five bucks a month or 50 bucks a year, and it really helps support the show. Uh, as you know, we're demonetized on YouTube. And so, you know, that's sort of how we are uh, building a, a, a separate community. There's a lot of good stuff that's taking place over there, including a live monthly meetup that takes place on Zoom on Saturday, July 24, 2021. If you're already registered, you're good to go. But I'm going to repost the registration form as the date nears. It's available for free to anybody who's a member over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And it's a lot of fun. We had about 37 people on last time. About half the, the audience had the camera on, about half people had their cameras off, and you know maybe the, the FBI agents were in there, I don't know. But the point is, we learned a lot. We got to hear from people from other parts of the world, we got to hear from people from other professions, and sort of get a, a, a variety of perspectives on some of the things that we talk about here, and it really is, it really is a lot of fun. It was powerful. It's sort of like a more intimate version of a clubhouse room because you can kind of see everybody and it's just a lot of fun. So come check that out, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And I've got some other ideas and some things that I want to work on to build the community up a little bit, like maybe a community directory where we can kind of support each other's projects. Like if you've got a YouTube channel and you, you know maybe you're creating some content that might be you know, sort of synergistic with some of the things that we're talking about here, I have no problem supporting the heck out of that because I think we need more people standing up and speaking out. And if you're writing or speaking or you're doing something on behalf of uh, freedom in this country, well, I want to support the hell out of you. So we're going to talk about all of that and more at this upcoming uh, Watching the Watchers monthly Zoom meetup. I'm looking forward to that. So please check that out and be sure to check out some of the links in the description below. I've got like three videos queued up for the crypto channel. I just haven't recorded them yet. Things have been, uh, you know, a little bit... Uh, let's say, uh, dynamic here at the office this week. So we are uh, adjusting on the fly, but we're, we're going to make do. And I want to just invite you to come check us out on some of those other channels. We are going to get back in the routine of publishing those. And I also, by the way, I also uploaded a video on TikTok. The link is down in the description. I tried this new format out where I can sort of do my slide switching also on the TikTok vertical format. So we're going to be playing around with those. We're, we're trying some new things, my friends. We're trying to sort of, you know, expand a little bit. And of course, I always appreciate all your help on this. We've got something special happening over here. And so I, I really am grateful for all of you. So that is it for me, my friends. We're going to be back here same time, same place tomorrow, same location at 4 p.m. Arizona time, 5 p.m. Mountain, 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. on that East Coast. And for that one Florida man out there, everybody else have a wonderful evening. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye.